We have three panelists. Our first panelist will be Lisa Simmons from the Roxbury International Film Festival. Our second panelist will be Kavria Baumgartner, Assistant Professor of English and Women's Studies. And our third panelist will be Professor Dia Khanzit, also a Professor of English and Women's Studies. So we changed up the order a little bit, so I'll be presenting first. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so the theme of the conference today and tomorrow is express yourself, identity, style, and adornment. Um, in this film discussion panel, we want you to express yourself, your views, your opinions, and your perspective. So we will keep our remarks relatively brief. And we invite you to ask questions um, and share comments about this 2018 superhero blockbuster film, Black Panther. So how many of you have seen Black Panther? Awesome, yes. <laughs> so this is going to be a lively discussion then, because I'm sure there are a lot of opinions about it. Um, this is an image of, I think, Okay, so here is an image from a Twitter user, um, and we get a sense of the film's um, success just looking at this, right? Um, this film was played almost everywhere, right? Uh, multiple showings, it was hotly anticipated. Um, it premiered in Los Angeles um, on January 29th of this year, um, and it was screened, screened around the world, right? Um, and so I wanted to give you this figure because it gives you a sense of the enormity of the film. Um, it shattered box office records, grossing over $1.3 billion, yeah. right, in worldwide ticket sales. So that, that actually is a, we do a round of applause for that. And it's still going, right? It's still going. Right. Um, and 700 million of that was in North America, right? So this is huge for a lot of reasons um, that I think uh, Professor Consett and Lisa Simmons will talk about. This film was a major milestone, absolutely incredible, um, not just because of the monetary success, but also because of the film's premise and the film's cast. So Black Panther is about a thriving, technologically advanced African nation, Wakanda, right? Wakanda forever. Uh, it features mostly black characters. The film's hero, T'Challa, is a black man. The film's director is a black man. And the film's costume designer is a black woman, um, whom we'll probably talk a little bit more about um, in the discussion. So it seems like a no-brainer now, right? Of course we're going to produce this movie. It's a superhero film. It'll gross a billion dollars. Um, but the film was not destined to be profitable. Um, and that's not how Hollywood producers often think about um, films, especially films with an all-black or majority black <coughs> cast. Um, oftentimes, Hollywood producers question whether these black films, often called niche films, will be successful. Um, and so Professor Consett and, and Lisa Simmons will talk more about that. Um, I just wanted to float two questions for us um, for discussion. Um, I have a question about style, right, given the um, conference theme, and then a question about gender. So the first question is about costume design. And I want us to think about how um, the film evokes an Afro-futuristic element, right, or elements through its costume design. And Lisa Simmons will talk more about Afrofuturism, how we define it, and why this film actually might be symbolic of that. So when you're thinking about, and we'll see clips too, think about sort of the Black Panther suit, we'll think about um, Queen Ramonda's crown, um, the uniform of the Dora Milaje, right? How are we thinking about costume design? And the second question um, is about gender. So in Wakanda, uh, some of the women are indeed strong and smart, right? We have the Dora Milaje, and then we have Shuri, right? Who some critics see as the smartest um, character, actually, in the film, because she's the one who allows T'Challa um, the technical gadgets that makes him um, heroic, that makes him successful. So, but the point is that the men are kings, right? Um, and so how does this film, if it does, really elevate the representation of black women? Um, think about someone like Killmonger, right? His violence 
and who dies at his hands, right? So throughout the film, he's violent, particularly toward African-American women along with others. But let's think about that representation of gender and the re representation of African-American women. So I leave you with those two questions and I'll pass it along now to Lisa Simmons. film festival. I've been doing it for 20 years and I have to say that every single time we do something, something happens. So this is wonderful. It's just the nature of the business. Um, so my name is Lisa Simmons. I run the Roxbury International Film Festival in Boston. It is the largest film festival in New England that celebrates people of color around the world. Um, we got into this business 20 years ago and we'll talk a little bit about this as I go through my slides because 20 years ago there was very, very little representation uh, of black people on the screen. Um, so the people that were doing that were independent filmmakers. So a lot of the independent filmmakers from Boston, my hometown, weren't getting into any festivals because people didn't understand the black aesthetic. They didn't understand uh, that there were other stories and multiple stories about the African diaspora and they only really wanted to have stories about urban blight and poverty and all of these other things and black love and uh, family didn't fit into that. So the Roxbury International Film Festival was started for that reason. So I just wanted to sort of take a step back because we are talking about We are talking about Afrofuturism here, and I just wanted to sort of get, you know, put it all in context. So, uh, uh, Yatasha Womack said, Afrotourism exists before it was called Afrofuturism, right? So we know this, and we know this because we know Octavia Butler, and we know Sam Delaney, and we know Sun Ra. We're doing a lot of things around science fiction. She says it's always going to exist because it's the human's desire to want to shape your present and your future, to embrace the imagination. Mark Deary, who is a white cultural critic, critic from New York, sort of said, look, African American history in the 1990s, he said, African American history is obscured by slavery and urban blight and racism and poverty, and the only way to create our own worlds, or he would say your own worlds, um, is an art and literature and technology where you can see yourselves as power players and players in the future. And part of that is very true, right? It's about Afrofuturism is about putting yourself in a place, in a space where you're solving problems, where you're activists, where you have the power. And why not create those worlds like Octavia Butler did and others to, to help be, have, have readers and other people feel powerful in a space, in a place where they didn't feel power at all. So this was the 90s, this was you know Octavia Butler and, and Sam Delaney and Sun Ra obviously were before this time, but you know it, it was really science fiction. It was really a way for, for them to, uh, to, to express themselves and feel powerful. So, Fast forward uh, to the 1990s. For the first film ever, anyone did, has anyone seen Meteor Man? Okay, if you have not seen it, put it on your list. Robert Townsend is one of my favorite filmmakers, and I'll tell you why. Because Robert Townsend made Hollywood Shuffle with credit cards. And he also made The Five Heartbeats. And this film that he made came after The Five Heartbeats. He created it, as it says on the screen, I cre I'll create a world that nobody has ever seen before. The thing for me was that I was always battling to create new images for black people, and that was the goal. So for Robert Townsend, he's a comedian, right? Uh, but but he, his, his films are so important to black culture. So, you know, he made Hollywood Shuffle because he couldn't get a job as a black actor and he wanted to make fun of that and it was hysterical and many of us who are actors and I was an actress at a time um, felt that and understood that and it really resonated with a lot of people I created this mystical magical superhero world but I also put real values in what's going on in the community again same thing that Octavia Butler and others before him were doing only now he's doing it on film 
And this is 1993. So in the 1990s, we have to understand that Hollywood was going through this resurgence. So not, I wouldn't say that. They've never really gone through a resurgence. But Hollywood, <laughs> Hollywood was looking at the black aesthetic very differently because you had Boys in the Hood, you had Spike Lee, you had John Singleton, you had all of these filmmakers who were putting out all of this incredible independent film work. And remember that, because independent film and independent filmmakers is an important word here. All of these films were done by independent filmmakers. And I don't care if Ryan Coogler made Black Panther for Disney, he made Fruitvale Station first, and that was an independent film. So all of these films are being made by these independent filmmakers who want what all of us wanted is to see themselves on the screen. And Robert Townsend looked at his kids and said, you know, I want, to see, I want my kids to see that. I grew up with Batman, and I grew up with Superman, and now I want to, I want to create something that's mine. Um, so, so he said that this is what he's going to do. Some people, some one person said, one might say that Robert Townsend flew so that Chadwick Boseman could purr. I don't know if those two go together, but something like that. So. Um, 25 years before Black Panther, um, and five years before Wesley Snipes, uh, the, this was the first black superhero. So fast forward, okay, to 1998, when Wesley Snipes' Blade comes on the scene, all right? So here's Wesley Snipes. Marvel is, now you gotta understand Marvel, because I love those numbers that we just got, and everyone's clapping, it's amazing. Black Panther made a million billion dollars. Who got that money? And Disney, okay? So it's really, again, and we'll talk about this, about owning our own product, right? So it's great and it's wonderful that Black Panther did that, but Robert, people like Robert Townsend and Spike Lee and other people wanna make sure that they're keeping control of that, uh, of that film so that they're the ones making the money. So Blade comes on the market, Wesley Snipes is this kick guy, crazy, dark superhero. Um, but the most important part of Blade was that it set the stage for the few further Marvel comic book adaptations. So Blade got made so that Black Panther could get made, all right? So Marvel is smart. Marvel does a lot of research, they do a lot of analysis, they know what's trending in the marketplace. And so Meteor Man, People are like, aha, you know, Robert Townsend's a silly guy, and it's funny. And, and we can even talk about the costumes in that film. He had people like in gold with dripping chains, and like they were the gang, but whatever, they were the gold gang, I think they were called. Um, and so Blade comes on board. So now we've got this movement, and we see what's happening. So after Blade, which people are trying to figure out what's going on, but you also understand that the comic book world is still moving and churning, and people are still trying to think about how the comic books are gonna be made into movies, maybe, but they come on the screen, and maybe they, you know, as we're moving to the 2000s, things are changing, right? Independent filmmakers who were making their movies in the 90s are now sort of looking for places to go because the Hollywood studios figured out that these films are making money and we're gonna pull all those indie studios under, under our umbrella, right? So then they were starting to make the, the, you know, they were making the decisions about what movies get made. So we go through this whole, um, you know, moving into the 2000s into this more progressive movement and Marvel is like, hmm, you know, how can we capitalize on this? How can we capitalize on this? So what do they do? Luke Cage comes on the scene, 2016. Luke Cage, anyone Luke Cage fans? Okay, there you go. So Luke Cage, former conflict, superhuman strength, unbreakable skin, fights corruption. Um, so this is Marvel. In general, they present counterculture and popular culture and they focus on social issues, right? Because of this change and support of a more progressive movement, this is the sweet spot for Marvel to appeal to this progressive movement and to push for more diversity um, in casting. They get this, they understand, they see what's happening. And one of the things that people see too is that if you follow film and you follow independent film, you will see that in, at Sundance, things are starting to happen, right? You've got Birth of a Nation that gets picked up for $17.5 million. You've got Dear White People that gets picked up. You have all these black films that are starting to be picked up by independent filmmakers, and the studios are saying, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? How are we going to capitalize? And this is a business. Film is a business, 
right? And so it's wonderful that we get to see Luke Cage, and it's wonderful that we get to see Black Lightning. Another one? Anyone else? Sci-fi. Oh, it's my sci-fi book. So, and we get to see uh, Black Lightning. Black Lightning is not Marvel. It's DC Comics. But it's interesting because here's DC Comics, which has been a, co a rival with Marvel, right? Forever and ever. Marvel is, uh, you know, DC Comics is more like Superman, Batman, more colorful stories where Marvel is much more like, you know, just the average guy who goes out and create and, and saves the world, like we all want to do. So they create Black Lightning. He's got a correct, uh, creates a positive role model. Um, he's got a daughter who's, you know, and they're all like upscale, right? She's a star athlete. The other one's a medical school in medical school. His ex-wife's a neuroscientist. He's a principal and a and a former superhero. So we start to see, right? We start to see this. This, this pattern that people are that people are picking up and saying, you know, we need to be part of this. So what does it lead to? Nothing. <laughs> Black Panther. Here we go. What does Black Panther do mostly? It uplifts everybody. Everyone comes out of that movie thinking, oh my gosh, that is incredible. You know? And this, what Black Panther does is it go back, goes back to Wesley Snipes. Do you know why? Wesley Snipes, when he finished Blade, wanted to produce Black Panther. And it sat in development for years and years and years and years. Wesley Snipes went to jail. Wesley, Wesley Snipes is not producing Black Panther. So what happens during this time? Ryan Coogler does Fruitvale Station. Picked up, major film. What does he do next? Creed. He does Creed, he makes a ton of money. And all of a sudden, Marvel's like, whoa, hey, well, and then they ask him, what do you want to do next? He says, I want to do Black Panther. Ryan Coogler gets Black Panther. He gets Black Panther. And it was such a success because Ryan Coogler got to write the story and he got to direct it. A friend of mine, a colleague, we were talking about this, and he said, the story was written by two white men, as we know Black Panther was. But Marvel wanted to code it in blackness, and that's why they hired Coogler. Things are starting to change, right? Because we understand, they, Marvel understands that they need to appeal to the black aesthetic. They need to appeal to black people, and they're not going to be able to do it if there are white people writing the story. So they go to Brian Coogler, and they say, we want you to do this. And what is, and Brian Coogler is perfect for this. He's from Oakland. He's a scruffy, independent filmmaker. He knows the black community better than anybody, and he does that. He creates Black Panther in a different way, um, and, he, and, he, and he puts forth these incredible questions. You know, what if we have a global African diaspora? What if all of these African countries come together and help support each other? Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Like, what's the world going to do? So it's all of these questions that keep getting asked in Black Panther, and we'll talk about that in the panel. And I just wanted to talk one, a little bit more, just a second more. What comes out at the same time as Black Panther, A Wrinkle in Time? Did anybody see A Wrinkle in Time? Yep. Not as many, okay. <laughs> Support my sister Ava, please. This is a great film. So Ava, let's go back. Octavia Butler, Ava is, is, is inspired by Octavia Butler. She, Ava too, like Ryan Coogler, gets the opportunity to do A Wrinkle in Time because she just made a ton of money on Selma. Because she just did 13, because she's an amazing filmmaker. And she's an independent filmmaker, right? She's an independent filmmaker. And she said, someone said to her, you know, this is a $100 million film. And she said, I know it's $100 million. Disney will be fine. <laughs> Ava didn't care whether or not it, it was like Black Panther. All she cared about, that there was a film that she created where people felt that they were represented and had a voice. And this is the film that she made. And it's important because there are so many little girls around the world who have seen this film and said, wow, that's me. Again, representation in films. And it doesn't necessarily have to be future. It's, we're dealing with the present. We're dealing with the present day. There are so many films out there now that ne aren't necessarily termed Afrofuturism. You've got The Hate You Give that's coming up right now, um, which is an incredible film that just tells the different narrative 
of the African American story. It's huge, it's long, just like anybody else's stories. You have people that are living in poverty and in urban environments, but you also have wealthy people that are living in other places. It's not just in one place. And this is the thing that people really wanted with Black Panther. They wanted to see you know, power, and they wanted to see beauty, and they wanted to see all these incredible people on screen that looked like them, and that were, and that had money, and had power, and could do things. And that is really, really um, an important part of why Black Panther worked the way it worked. You have not seen this movie yet. No. Who? Who's seen it? <gasps> okay. I streamed, this was the opening night film at the Roxbury International, I'll be very quick. This is the opening I filmed at the Roxbury International Film Festival. You need to bring, ask anyone to bring it here. It's not Afrofuturism, but it is another animate. It's an animated documentary story that tells an entirely different narrative of Africa and the African storyline and poor African kids in an orphanage. And it is one of the I have been curating film this film festival for twenty years, and I have never seen a film like this. So write it down. Do you agree? Yeah, the animation is by a black animator um, named Shofro Kochler. So I just wanted to, to share that with you because she is the superhero, but she's a modern day superhero uh, that gets animated on the screen. So in closing, before we go to our panel, um, maybe not, oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> so in closing, uh, Brian Carter, the University of um, Africana Studies said, we're starting to see something very interesting conversations with regard to people thinking about black superheroes or stories. Afrofuturism is seeing not a reemergence but a surge in recent years. What we are seeing now is just an evolution and an expansion or enhancement of the same messages to try that try to address the disparities. Afrofuturism, he says, is not an escapist form of literature, music, or art. It is not merely aesthetic. It is, in some respects, a form of activism. So let's think about that as we're talking about the panel. And the other thing as we're talking about Marvel, my colleague again said to me, Black Panther is not part of a movement, but a corporate ploy to take advantage of a progressive movement to make money. And with that, let's talk. Um, Ryan Coogler, um, as Lisa has stated, um, is an indie director. He did that amazing Fruitvale Station, um, and then of course followed it up with Creed. Both of them made money. Marvel went to him and said, please, um, we would like to start talking with you about, um, about Black Panther. And Ryan Coogler really took his time. He took his time and he, um, he even went to Africa and to, to decide if he wanted to do it, even though it wasn't filmed in Africa, it was actually filmed in Atlanta and Argentina. <laughs> yeah. We got the High Museum in there, to, and it was like the, supposedly the London uh, Museum, and it's not, um, the High Museum. Uh, but um, at any rate, um, they talked with him, offered him the position. Uh, actually, um, Alva DuVernay turned it down. They offered it to her first, and she turned it down, um, I guess, to take um, a wrinkle in time. Um, Ryan Coogler then said he thought about it, thought about it when visited Africa, thought he could really do something, and he said, I'll do it, but only if you put into my contract that, um, and this is Marvel. Marvel, since 2009, has been owned by Disney. These are, this is an industry, you know, a conglomerate. They have their own in-house cinematographers, their own in-house editors, their own in-house special effects people, their own in-house writers, because they want the style and aesthetic to stay the same. And this is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They have a lot at stake with keeping it similar. It's not simply about the Black Panther. It's about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And, you know, of course, um, 
all the money that that brings in. Um, so he told them, he said, I will not come unless I can bring my long-term collaborators. And he says, I want to bring Rachel Morrison, his DP who worked with him on, on um, director of photography, does a cinematography um, on Fruitvale Station. I want to bring Hannah Beachler, my production designer, who worked with him on both Fruitvale Station Creed. She also did the production design for Moonlight. Um, this is an amazing woman. She also did two of Beyonce's videos, including Lemonade. He says, I want to bring my own composer. I mean, and, and composition is everything in this sort of um, uh, um, in this sort of comic book world where they have their own superhero compositions or whatever, um, <coughs> when they fly and do all these things. He says, and uh, um, he, his long-term collaborator, a Swedish, a young Swedish guy, Ludwig Göransson, who um, was a long-term, uh, also a long-term collaborator with Childish Gambino, um, and also Chance the Rapper. Um, so he wanted to bring all of them in, and his editor, Michael, uh, Michael Schauber. And he says, only if I bring them in will I do it. And he says, because together, this is the only way we can create this world of Wakanda. And he says he wanted a representation that would give free reign, bring it all together um, with this whole thing of technology and tribal culture. And he also wanted to do away with the traditional um, representation um, in popular uh, film. And Hollywood had it broke um, um, the rule of three, the rule of three being that there's more than three black people in it. It's a niche film, um, which explains why Denzel is all alone, Samuel Jackson is all alone, Will Smith is all alone, and, and, you know, and Eddie Murphy was also all alone. Um, all, they're always alone. And if they have families, like Will Smith did in Independence Day, they separate them, and they make them dysfunctional in many ways, because there's a whole thing with family there, that because um, you represent them the national history, um, which is why Lee Daniels Butler, um, even though I don't like that, all that melodrama in it, but that was an amazing film where you tell a national history through that of a black family. That's a, just an amazing film. Um, at any rate, uh, this is what ha this is what happened um, when he did that. I kind of wish Aubrey Duvernay had said that to Disney as well. <laughs> if I could bring my own people and work with them, um, or whatever. But um, he brought his own people, and you can see that on every level. He wrote it. He worked with these long time. These are not just. Um, that he just started working with, long-term collaborators. He had worked with them on, um, he'd been working with the composer since his school days, his um, film days at, at um, Southern California, University of Southern California, USC, um, had been working with him on that. So these are all old-time things, and they knew exactly how to move and what to do, and the, um, uh, the result, I think, was um, quite something. So let's just take a look uh, and just pay attention to the way um, the, um, how it effortly moves in between the tribal culture, mixing it with, with uh, sci-fi elements of technology, the use of color, the use of sound. It has to have one of the things uh, Marvel was really on it, they were watching that Ludwig Göransson, the composer, it has to have that superhero sound. And, uh, and what he did is he mixed the drum beats. He also went to Africa and took a um, tour around and did all these things and has to mix that in with comic book, <laughs> comic book compositions um, that are so standardized. Okay, um, just some things to keep in mind for our discussion. Uh, this use of colors along with um, uh, that the cinematography, uh, Rachel Moore, cinematographer Rachel Morrison, um, and Hannah Beachler, the production designer, um, really worked together on it. Since they had been, they worked together on um, Fruitvale and knew one another. Um, they really um, nicely complemented each other on this. All throughout, very tight colors. Um, the, all the different tribes have different colors. Um, Shuri's lab um, is in the cold um, technological colors of white 
and um, um, blue. And when they do the abstraction, um, because this science is associated with that, they use graffiti um, and, and mix that in her lab and all of that. And it's interesting when she's fighting, she then moves to red. Um, Nakia, who is kind of the social justice person, um, will bring um, both the traditional and the technology together, and she's green. She, so she's always associated with green throughout the entire film, and they're always showing green highlights around her, her green clothes, her green dresses, and all of that. And of course, the prince is in um, mainly black and um, uh, black and all of that. Okay, so let's let's talk. <laughs> three things, um, statements. Uh, the first one is um, I'm addressing the first speaker and um, I throughout follow the Marvel Universe and sci-fi and, and um, I have students that are actually really into sci-fi and you know the graphic novels and all that and I want to know um, do you know much about the pro issue with the Matrix and the Terminator how that was actually supposed to be in, all in one story and it was written by a black woman and how in the world were they able to get the rights to separate them and make the Matrix and the Terminator, you know, without her permission? That was one thing. Um, I didn't know. I did. I did hear that, but I didn't know the full story about that. And if anyone knows about it, uh, secondly, I was going to mention uh, Pacific Rim Two and the role of Boyega. That then you said about how the person's always alone. And even though his father, you know, had saved the world and everything, and he was black, he just Alba. But I did like that role of Boyega in in the Pacific Rim too, and how he had teamed up with actually Clint Eastwood's son, you know, and he but showed how he was a leader in that. Uh, secondly, um, I'm concerned with the a lack of publicity that uh, novelists have in making sci-fi epics and particularly one that was an idol of mine, which is uh, Virginia Hamilton, and how she had a very etherical way of writing in general, you know, in her youth uh, books for children and youth um, concerning just uh, uh, black life in the South in particular. But one um, trilogy that she made that I feel is absolute genius, and I try to get as many issues as I can of it because it's out of print, is um, the one dust, um, Justice and Her Brothers, it's a trilogy. Justice and Her Brothers, Dustland, and The Gathering. And it's a trilogy, and I have like three sets of the trilogy because I know that they're out of print, but that is the most genius science fiction that I've ever read, you know, that's particularly aimed at um, young people. It's seventh grade, it's supposed to be sixth, seventh grade, but it's, it's, it was amazing. And if they could make a movie out of that, you know, that would be absolutely, you know, I, it, unbelievable. Um, and so that's just the, the three things I want to say. Oh, also that Walter Dean Myers actually wrote, uh, wrote um, he had authored a sci-fi book that's also equally good. But I, for the life of me, I'm getting a mental block and I, and I can't think of the name of it, but I actually have it and I can't think of the name of it. But it's a really, really good sci-fi. I don't know, is this on? I don't know about the um, Matrix and the Terminator. Um, I did hear uh, things where they had to pay off somebody for the Matrix, but I didn't know who was connected to um, the Terminator and all, all of that. Um, but, you know, one of the things with these big movie houses when they're making these big blockbusters, um, first of all, they don't want the writer there. <laughs> Um, they'll take their own, um, because of different mediums for one thing, but they also just um, want to keep the writer, the original um, writer away. And they'll often, um, one of the things that filmmakers like to do, um, Hitchcock used to do it, they will go out and buy a script under a pseudonym. 
and so you get it cheaper, you know, instead of saying, oh, it's me, Albert Hitchcock, I would like to buy your, your, um, your novel, the rights to your novel, to turn it into, then you give me some high, uh, so maybe something like that happened, but I don't know about the um, uh, Matrix and Terminator. I, I had heard all these kind of talk, though, about um, Matrix and something that was going on um, with Matrix, and that they had, it was stolen or something. They took the idea of, of and had. There was a lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think she won. She did. Yeah, she, yeah, did. she did. Yeah. And so she got money for it, but I think they just threw money at it, at her, and so she kept quiet or whatever. But yeah, I didn't know anything. I don't know what that was connected with the Terminator. Uh, yeah, I also have a couple comments in, with respect to the question about um, the Matrix and Terminator. Um, that author was Sophia Stewart, um, and um, I think it was in the Sophia Stewart. Sophia Stewart. Uh, I think it was in the 1960s or uh, 1970s. She submitted a story for like a newspaper ad calling for screenplays, and she submitted a story. She never heard back. But years later, the Terminator came out, and then years later, the Matrix, you know, was made. But yeah, they were all a part of the same uh, story; they're all connected uh, to one another. Um, but I did want to um, uh, raise a couple points about uh, Black Panther. Um, the first was to the first presenter, who uh, raised a question about the representation of women in the film, um, and I just wanted to observe that in 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 the in the film. Uh, I, I found the portrayal of women to be very powerful because um, they weren't presented as just mere supporting characters to the male actors. Um, they didn't accessorize them as women often do in, in other uh, superhero movies and, you know, and, and even in black films. Uh, but they stand on their own strength, power, and intelligence. You know, they're queens and generals and <coughs> covert military operatives. You know what I mean? Like they. They each have their own uh, power that I think balances the male characters. And in fact, um, you know, uh, for a majority of the film, they are not only uh, supporting, you know, uh, Chala and his uh, his um, uh, conquests, uh, but they're also advising him as king, like in ways that he can, you know, be most effective in his rulership. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask was maybe uh, for the the, uh, the second speaker. Um, to ask for a bit of clarity around the, the uh, assertion that um, that the making of the Black Panther film was a, a, a ploy, a corporate ploy, um, to capitalize on this, you know, um, interest and in engagement around black narratives. Uh, you know, I, 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 the reason that I ask is because, um, uh, you know, Black Panther wasn't just a film that Marvel made up just to, you know, tap into black audiences like this storyline, this character has been around since 1966 um, and has been engaged uh, by a number of uh, black authors and film producers. Uh, the Hudlin Brothers, you know, did an animated series in the 90s, a decade before uh, Blade came out. Um, you know, we had Ta-Nehisi Coates tapped, you know, to write a storyline uh, a few years ago. And, and again, a, a number of people have really engaged this idea. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious about that because as you if you're uh, familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, then you understand the role that Black Panther plays in the broader scope of the narrative, um, in that his character is very significant to the Avengers narrative, uh, to Fantastic Four narrative, um, and in a lot of different ways. And so I just wanted some clarity around no. what, what that assertion was about. Absolutely, and I'm not saying that um, that that's why Black Panther was made. And I under I know Black Panther from way back to, to present day, and all the people that are rewriting it, and you know, giving Ryan Coogler the opportunity to write it because it really needed a black narrative with a um, with a black writer and a black director. You know, I'm simply just sort of throwing that out there because as we talked about um, Marvel, it's a corporation, right? And uh, and and they are really they are really good at uh, understanding the trends and tapping into what's going on in society at a particular time. And, you know, I mean, Black Panther, I'm not saying that it wasn't an amazing film, it was. I'm not saying that he uh, is an incredibly strong character and that Black Panther did for black people 
what no movie has really done in a really long time, and that was to support black women, to support black family, to support black love, to raise the question about African Americans and Africans, uh, which oftentimes we don't really talk about and delve into, which we really need to, because it's a huge issue in our community to be able to do that. So it was sort of a throw out, like, you know what I mean? It's like, they are a corporate entity. We have to understand that. And although you know they made the choice in 2000 to really bring Black, Black Panther as a major character to the forefront, and like I said, Blade really set the stage for these new Marvel characters to become movies, and Marvel knows that. They're, they're gonna be making more. Avengers is amazing. And, um, and so I, it's just sort of to say it's wonderful. Um, but Marvel does do this, right? And they do capitalize on these, on, on, the, on the trends and, the, and what's going on in the social construct in order to you know, create and bring these characters forward. Is it good? Yeah, it's wonderful because it gives the opportunity for films like Black Panther to be made, but it's also a huge money maker um, for them. So that's all. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a point about um, gender and uh, women in the film. So we do have Shuri, who, as I said, some critics have seen her as being the smartest um, <coughs> character in the film, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, but if we think about Killmonger, uh, as far as we can tell in the film, I'm pretty sure that his girlfriend—he shoots his girlfriend, right? Um, he then strangles one of the women. Um, after he's taken, after he's um, is sort of overtaken um, T'Challa, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so there's women. The ways in which women are um, abused in the film mm -hmm. is a problem, right? I mean, yep. you do have Shuri, which is great. We do have Queen Ramona, but she still doesn't hold power as far as I mean, she can't ascend to the throne, right? She's not. So there's there's ways in which the representation of black women is problematic. Um, although it may be a step in the right direction to have someone like Shuri and someone like Ramon. So I was thinking more about uh, Killmonger and his violations of black women. Uh, what's interesting is that Shuri in the comic, not in the film, in the comics, um, she often uh, becomes the Black Panther and um, goes out and <coughs> does things and they're also encouraging her to become the queen. Um, so she, um, she works closely with all of that, and she is at times the Black Panther. So that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's um, in regards to the gender thing, um, I think it's awesome that the women are holding positions of power, but I think it's important to note that it's still in order to uplift a man. Um, and that's something I've always had like an issue with and I don't think we talk about enough because, oh, we're just so excited to have a black film and a black superhero, but we're also <coughs> still perpetuating these gendered things and again, disenfranchising black women and what do black women do? Always uplift black men. And what did the black men do for them? Nothing. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but I think that that's worth noting. Um, so like when Shuri becomes Black Panther, like I will be there and I would love to see what gender is like when Shuri is a Black Panther, and then we could talk about it again. <laughs> Hi, I, I wanted to get you to repeat, Lisa, you, there's a lovely quote, um, which I don't know if I have it correctly. Afrofuturism, is a form of activism. Did you say social activism? No, it says um, Brian Carter, who is a, a professor of African studies at U of A, said uh, Afrofuturism Afro is not an escapist form of literature, music, and art, and it's not merely it's not merely aesthetic. It is, in some respect, a form of activism. Yeah, I love that. It's a great. Which I think it's very quote. true. We see that in Octavia, but we see it in all of this black sci-fi, and um, it's it's interesting to watch sort of the issues that come out in these films. And it's sort of I don't know. I I feel like it's kind of a way. It sort of like softens as you're watching this incredible film, but there's always peppered through it these 
social justice, activism types of um, themes that go through it. And I feel like there were so many of those in Black Panther that you really need to see it a couple of times to understand. After, um, after I saw Black Panther, we screened a film in Boston called Black and Black, and it was about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, if you get a chance to, I think they're doing the festival circuit, but it was, you know, I, I, I sort of hesitated to screen it because it was long and I was like, it's a lot of talking heads. And, um, but when I saw it, it, it was, it was eye-opening to me because I, you know, it's, it's an issue that was very deeply rooted in Black Panther. Um, and like the women, um, you know, sort of, you know, being there for the men, that we, we don't really talk about that, but we don't talk about this issue, like I said before, about Africans and African Americans. And seeing that documentary, I was like, wow, this is, this is really real, and we do have these sort of deep-seated issues um, among, among us, and so those are some things that need to be resolved. They ended up not really being resolved in Black Panther, as Killmonger died, but, um, but, but, but they're real, they're real issues. Thank you. And um, Delia, um, you said he wanted to create this world of Wakanda. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell me what Wakanda is? Uh, Wakanda, the African nation that is hidden away um, and represents a form of utopia um, uh, and, and all of the hopes and all, you know, all of this in kind of a um, science fiction fantasy uh, sort of way. So uh, you know that's the the you know the, that's the the name of their nation and they all live Wakanda forever, and and this recreation um, at the level of music, cinematography, editing, and all of that that's what creates that world, and it's so nicely done, even though it wasn't at all filmed in Africa. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to make a comment. I wanted to bring hair into uh, into a discussion, and actually we have a panel about this tomorrow, so please come. And uh, I imagine Dr. Galomsky probably knows so much more about this than I do. I, I don't work on African hair, but because I work on on hair of black people, I know certain things. Right, so we have um, we have the red. Namibian women, the, the red braids, right? So it's like butter fat and red okra. So we have that representation that we have. Uh, Queen Ramonda was wearing this beautiful headpiece that I cannot pronounce how it's called. Can you say this again? Zitoro. Uh, there you go. And then uh, General Yukone, she uh, thinks that wig is a disgrace, right? So she actually enters this moment where she throws it uh, in a bar. We see that. So. And there is, uh, I, I don't remember who of you was talking about um, kind of global Africa, and we have representations of different, I remember after the Chawa, I think is initiated, he has different, uh, different like um, wax, he has different patterns on his, I think on his gown, some of it comes from Nigeria, some of it comes from Ghana. So we have a lot of different cultures brought in um, non-verbally non through costume, because you were discussing colors, but there are also textures, there are also hair, and I was wondering, and also there is a lip plate, right? Um, one of the characters has a yeah. lip plate. So I'm wondering if there's anything else that I'm not mentioning that we can bring into, into the discussion and actually talk about this at dormant and also bringing Africa together when, within the space. Um, yeah, the various masks as well all the body painting, um, even uh, the Michael B. Jordan character, he uh, you know, takes that mask and then he has adorned himself with, uh, you know, the, um, for all his kills and all of that. Um, all these, uh, and yeah, it is it's exactly right with the textures, um, the graffiti in Shuri's lab, uh, all of the, you know, all, all of that. And then even the dirt um, when he's covered up with uh, um, uh, when he's covered up to visit his ancestral mm -hmm. home, that beautiful, um, it almost looks like irradiated sand or whatever. And then um, Mbaku um, and his tribe, the Jabari tribe, they really have those wonderful, um, it's almost their body becomes the color and the ornament. Uh, and that Winston Smith, he's got such stage presence. Um, just the way he says it is incredible. Um, but the, um, all, all of that, and then, then the ice, and instead of using sand, their tribe uses ice to cover him up. 
um, all of that, but it, it is wonderful textures. And yeah. one of the ideas that, that and, and the Akoya beads um, that are technology um, and, all, and how it's all organic and coming together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say one thing. Well, you mentioned hair, which is really interesting. And I heard, um, I heard that on the set they said there was not a pressing comb to be found. Yes. <laughs> this is what I wanted to say. Yeah. So it was not allowed. Say, yes. And that's a lot because black hair means a lot to black women. It's a huge statement that they were either bald or in braids or, um, you know, and I think that that's something that Ryan Coogler really wanted uh, to make sure of. And I just thought that that was like, yeah, that's like, that's amazing. It'd be yeah. interesting to see hear a paper about all the different hairstyles. Yeah, you could almost track the thing, and then when she, um, the queen with the gray hair, I mean, oh my God, <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> uh, talking about hair, I was wondering, what do you think about the movie Nappy Ever After, produced by Netflix? I think this is uh, mainly a question for Lisa mm. uh, about redefining style and. What do you think about Netflix and the campaign? This is not a moment, it's a movement. Well, it's really interesting because I was going to talk a little bit about net Netflix in my talk because Netflix is killing it. I mean, there are so many different stories, different African-American stories, African stories that Netflix is creating and not just picking up. And I think it's really an <coughs> incredible opportunity for, for filmmakers to find space there to, to present their stories. What do I think about Napoli Ever After? Did you ever see the film Something New that she was in? It's sort of the same film, and, the, and it centers around her hair, and it centers around uh, her being obsessed with her hair. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's touching on the same issue that happens, you know, in a lot of these movies where black women love their hair. And hairstyle is a representation of who you are. We change our hairstyle all the time. And and that's not, you know, it's because we can and we want to, but it's also an expression of who we are. If we're gonna wear our hair curly, we're gonna wear our hair straight, we're gonna wear it in braids, we're gonna, you know, and people will say, wow, your hair does so many things. And I'm like, yeah, it does, it's cool, because it, it's it's a, it's a almost an extension of who we are, correct, ladies? Is it not an extension of who we are? And, um, and so that film, I mean, I, I think that's basically what it, but it was trying to show that she was perfectly happy with her natural hair. And in the end, it worked out for her. It's a rom-com. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a light rom-com. Okay, just really quickly, this is also one of the critiques that um, I have of Wrinkle in Time. Yeah. Because, um, so the little girl is played as a, by a mixed race girl. Um, and she has this curly hair, but two or three times in the film, this um, the, the young white boy, I think so it's, yeah, he's always saying, your hair is so pretty, oh, well, you should wear it like that. And that bothers me, because yeah. Ava DuVernay, yeah. right, yeah, she, yeah. It, it's, she, it's okay she, you know. yeah, it's okay that you wear your hair like this, but I think that affirmation shouldn't come from a white boy. I, I don't <laughs> think that's how that would work, especially since she has a black mother who has similar hair. Right. <laughs> So it's just in the same way that Ryan Coogler could present these different hairstyles in Black Panther, it's really interesting that in the Wrinkle in Time, Ava DuVernay couldn't actually go there and see that. Yeah. I have a, other critiques of the film, but this is something we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, so this is amazing. Um, the Black Panther, I'm not a movie person, but I actually went and watched the Black Panther with my kids. And um, one of the things, for those of you over there who are expert, is when I sit down and I watch this, I can identify I've been, I'm a princess from Africa, I understand where we dress things, and how we do our hairs at different functions and different time in life. But I'm raising kids here. Um, when I'm in America, I'm not a princess, I am American. Um, then I took my kids to go watch this. I can interpret a lot of the movement and um, language and different things, styles and rituals and all that to them. But then my question is, how do I bring it home to these kids that are being raised here? What, how does it make sense? 
as much as this, such a fantastic, there's a black people there, and, and, and but they still struggle with, how do, how do I bring this home as a representation of my, of who we are? Um, I did have issues with, how do we re uh, reconcile the message here? I mean, I believe you touched on that, I was gonna ask that, with the African Americans, and me, who can, who is not, I mean, an African American or Nigerian African, whatever I choose to describe, <laughs> um, who grew up and have this rich identity of me that is really rooted in my <coughs> hometown in Nigeria, and then have my kids who were all born here. So bringing it home and making a lot of sense that really, not just for me, but also for my kids and my grandkids to come when we talk about this movie. Wow. Well, um, you know what, I, I feel like that's a, that's a big question for all immigrant families, right? Whether it's African, whether you're from the Middle East, whether you're from South America, is you're coming to a country that doesn't necessarily accept the, uh, the cultures that you're from and oftentimes uh, families lose that culture um, and because you don't want, because the kids don't want to be looked at as different. So they don't want to be Nigerian, they don't want to be Afghani, they don't want to be Indian, they don't want to be Muslim. Uh, you know, it's hard, right? But it's really about communication and it's really about not trying to hide where you're from. We, we are stronger because we connect with other cultures and we learn from other cultures. And once that stops, then we're just a monoculture. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like in this, in this current environment, it's, it's worse, right? It's worse because you can't go out there <coughs> and be an other uh, because the world is sort of against the other right now. Um, but, you know, like, I, I raised my son and my nephews. We all lived in one house. There were eight of us, my grandparents. We all lived in one house while the kids were getting raised. Uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, my son thought that was the craziest thing. He was so embarrassed that he lived with his grandparents. But he wrote his college essay about it, you know, because it meant a lot. And it was his culture, and he understood, and he got to experience that and understand that. And I feel like we don't do that here, and it's just important to have that conversation and communication with, uh, with your kids and your family and invite other people in. Invite other people in for dinner and invite people over to experience your culture. Invite other African Americans in to learn about the African culture. I, mean, I think the more that we're connected, the better off we are. I don't know if that's the right answer, but. Uh, yeah, um, speaking here. <laughs> Just so you know who we're talking. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you mentioned quite a bit about the use of color, the bright colors, the patterns, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Except it seems that the casting is on the lighter side of the African diaspora in the colors. Like if we were to look, I, I have not seen the film. Oh, let me do that. Because the women in the back here, if I was to walk in, the three on the left look really white. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, the one over on the right. Sorry. It's like yeah, okay, maybe she's African, but the well, three on the, my left. Actually, um, he is very dark, um, as some are, are some of the um, others are. Shuri is also somewhat dark. And of course, Nakia um, is, is very dark. And, and it, it, it really, um, the way Rachel Morrison captures the skin tones is just incredible. You know, it wasn't moonlight level where he got lost in those incredible skin tones. Yeah. Um, but it was close. And so it captured all the different color skin tones. So I thought, I thought it was on, on that level of, of skin color. I thought it was quite beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I think the I think one of the one thing that we can say about Black Panther is it really was a celebration of Black people, and it was something that came out when we really needed it. 
uh, and we continue to revisit it, I do, to see it, to just see those beautiful faces and, uh, and, and understand that. It was entertainment. Um, it had some lessons in it, but I think that uh, an entire, many generations embraced it uh, as something that they just felt that was needed uh, and healing uh, to see it. So I think for that, it was incredibly successful. Unfortunately, we are out of time. The, clearly, this panel created lots of uh, space for conversation. So please help me thank our panel with a round of applause.